Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks. Yes. I mean, as Mark said, I'm hoping that we can have a discussion. Um, uh, so that because uh, a lot of the issues that I'm raising are, I mean, it's people like you that are actually working on them and working up um, what are the ways of overcoming the barriers that I'm identifying. Um, as, as Mark said, I mean, to set the context for this, um, I, I, um, I stopped work a week before the last general election. Um, and um, I was at that point working, I was, I've been working for 20 years as a freelance consultant, but since about um, 2002, I was mainly working within central government. Um, as a consultant, um, firstly in the Prime Minister's Strategy Unit, which resulted in the improving the life chances of disabled people report, and then with the Office for Disability Issues, which was set up as a result of that report. Um, and as Mark said, I was working on the Independent Living Strategy and also on something called the Right to Control, um, which actually I think was in many ways the most radical. Uh, policy that we've managed to uh, get established and which does have the support of the current government although it's not clear exactly what its future is. Um, we, can, we can talk about, if you want to know more about that, we can talk about that in the discussion. But what um, the Joseph Rantry Foundation uh, gave me after I stopped work was the opportunity to reflect back on 20 years of disability policy um, and um, and I wanted to do that before I forgot about it all because mainly I'm thinking about my garden now, um, <laughs> which is much more pleasant I can tell you. Um, but, but by the time I actually came to write uh, this viewpoint, there was so much happening in terms of the existing disability policy, and so there were things happening so quickly, and we were going backwards at such a rapid pace. Um, that I found I wrote much more about what's currently going on than I'd originally intended to. Um, but it is set in the context of what had happened in the previous um, 20 years. Generally, that, the viewpoint makes the case um, that the disability movement needs to engage with broader debates uh, on the economy and on social policy if we're to have any chance of defending and building the kind of society that delivers um, human and civil rights for disabled people. Um, and what I'm arguing uh, is that, I mean, my starting point is that in order for disabled people to experience equal access to full human and civil rights and opportunities to improve their life chances, um, what we need is a system or a welfare state which does two things. Firstly, that it uses resources to create a level playing field for people who depend on oil health that otherwise create significant um, economic and social disadvantage. And that, that's an argument for um, what used to be called the universalist principle, um, which is something that isn't much talked about these days because it's been so undermined. Um, DLA is an example, so dis disability living allowance, personal independence payment is now becoming, um, is an example of a universal social policy. It's not means tested. It is actually about creating a level playing field for people who've got additional costs. Child benefit is another example, but it's been undermined because of the um, uh, removal it's, it's intended removal, although they're backtracking on it to people who um, are high rate taxpayers. The second um, feature of the kind of welfare state that we need in order to deliver full human and right, human and civil rights is that it must deliver resources in ways which enables autonomy for people who need support. Autonomy is that there's three crucial parts to being a citizen. The self-determination or autonomy participation and contribution. Um, and actually you can't participate, you can't contribute unless you have self-determination. And for people who need support to go about their daily lives, unless you have control over that support, you can't have self-determination, you can't be autonomous. Um, so um, that's the two key um, aspects 
that there need to be of a welfare state if we are to access full human and civil rights. And in the last 20 years or so, there have been windows of opportunity to make progress on these aspirations. And that's what people like me have been working within. You know, I didn't by any means agree with everything that the Labour government did. And there were some very difficult times. But there were these opportunities that were created that you, you know, one weaved between and tried to fit in with existing agendas to create those opportunities to make advances towards the kind of welfare state that I think we need. And we made some progress and sometimes we didn't. But at the moment, that progress has been undermined by a combination of economic developments and the associated changing role of the state. And that's creating a lot of difficulties for us. So to put it very briefly and too simplistically, what we currently have in terms of our economy is that we have high levels of secure employment at wages that are sufficient to sustain a reasonable standard of living are actually incompatible with the way our economy is currently configured. And that creates all sorts of difficulties, one of which is, and which is one of the most underexplored issues in the context of all the debates that have just been happening over the Welfare Reform Bill, is the way in which benefits are actually subsidising low wages and high rents. And that's what the benefit system does. That's what the cap is attacking, but actually will not prevent that subsidisation. So what, and also what's part of our current situation is that a progressive taxation system is actually incompatible with the economic reality of and the ideology associated with the requirements of global capital. Now that's a huge argument, which I'm not going to go into. As I said, I'm just putting this briefly and simplistically. And it's these factors which make a welfare state based on universal principles which deliver social and economic rights economically unviable. That's the fundamental problem that we face at the moment. It's not the creation of a dependency culture that's the problem, nor is it the so-called demographic time bomb that's the fundamental problem. The fundamental problem is the kind of economy that we've got and the ideology that's associated with it. And what the disability movement then faces is not only the struggle to make any progress in the context of these underpinning realities, but also the fact that the government, both this and the last government, has adopted the language of our analysis and our demands and used it to pursue policies which are actually creating significant disadvantage for disabled people. So, for example, the replacement of disability living allowance with personal independence payment, which aims to reduce the budget by 20%. And that's the purpose of replacing DLA with PIP, to reduce the expenditure by 20%. And the government's quite explicit about that. That what they're doing is using the social model of disability in the way that they are devising assessments in order to reduce eligibility for the new benefit. Which makes it even more difficult for us to oppose the reduction in the numbers of people that will qualify, because they're using our language. The reforms to incapacity benefit, its replacement by employment support allowance, which reduce eligibility, increase means testing, impose conditions and sanctions. What that whole policy did, which started under the last government, is that it took the demand made by the disability movement, our words that said most people, most disabled people both want to and can work, and turned that into justification for the really, really difficult situations that is being created 
for people particularly whose experience of ill health makes work actually very, very difficult, particularly work as it's currently configured. Um, what's also happened is that our demands for choice and control over the support that we need to go about our daily lives um, have actually been adopted in the context of social care policies which are more successful at delivering the marketisation of care services, the privatisation of care services, the creation of a market, than in delivering independent living. And I'm going to talk a bit more about that. And then what's even more scary is that that, that use of our demands for choice and control may well support the same trend in the context of healthcare, particularly non-acute continuing healthcare with the introduction of personal budgets for non-acute continuing health care. Um, and a final example is that the language and demands um, of user involvement of disabled people's own organisations um, having a legitimacy, all those that that language and demands have been incorporated into the so-called big society um, agenda, which actually aims to reduce the role of the state um, and reduce the resources put into the infrastructure that actually makes disabled people's organisations possible. Um, it's also very distressing for people like me, and I'm sure many of you, to see the continuing phenomenon of so-called involvement and consultation being treated as an end in itself, um, rather than treating it as a means to the end of enabling people who are affected by policy and service delivery um, to actually have a real impact on those things. Um, I uh, got into trouble uh, last week by blogging um, about the Office for Disability Issues most recent consultation document um, called Fulfilling Potential, which is the thing that they're doing because they, they're developing a disability strategy. And it's a really good example of good consultation. Uh, because they've learned how to do it. They've actually learned how to involve disabled people. Um, but it's been treated as an end in itself. You know, that's it. We're very good at doing this. But how's it going to impact on the actual policy? Um, so what I um, want to do today is to um, make explicit some of the principles that the disability movement has been promoting um, in the context of um, adult social care policies um, in the last 20 to 30 years. The, the viewpoint itself, um, if you read it, doesn't confine itself to adult social care policies. It's got quite a lot about what's happening with welfare benefits. But um, I wanted to just focus in this context on adult social care and to raise the question as to whether it's actually possible to make progress on those principles in the current climate, um, and if so, how? And that's why I'm hoping that we might have a discussion, because I think it's people in this room will have the better ideas going forward about um, how one might address those uh, difficulties. Um, so there's two important principles um, which um, the disability movement has been promoting in the context of adult social care. Um, and I'm sorry if, if this is really old hat for many of you, but the first, of course, is the social model of disability, which makes the crucial distinction between impairment um, and disability. Um, and that's what I put up there as just one of the ways of um, making that distinction. In the impairment and long-term characteristics of an individual that impact on their functioning and on their appearance, whereas disability is the disadvantage that's experienced by an individual resulting from social, economic, environmental or other barriers that impact on people with impairments and or ill health. So, in fact, the task for social policy is to tackle disabling barriers. You can't fix people's impairments, but you can fix the disabling barriers that they experience. Um, and the, the, the social model of disability was formally adopted by the government um, in 2005, uh, following many years of campaigning by several people and organisations. It was the Improving Life Chances um, report that formally adopted 
which at the time was seen as a great victory. At the moment it feels a bit like a hollow victory because, as I said, they're using the language against us, unfortunately. The second principle is that of independent living. And this, again, is just one way in which this principle has been articulated. I mean, the most shorthand expression is independent living is about having choice of control and support you need to go about your daily life. But this statement actually was one, I think it's one of the most important statements the disability movement made because it does make clear the principles that underpin the concept of independent living. It was a statement made by the British Council of Organisations of Disabled People in 1992, which said all human life is of value, that anyone, whatever their impairment, is capable of exerting choices. And that's a really, really important thing to hang on to. Whatever someone's level of cognitive or communication impairment, they're capable of expressing a preference. Our duty is to find out how they express those preferences. And that people who are disabled by society's reaction to their impairments have the right to assert control over their lives and that disabled people have the right to participate fully in society. That statement is very, very similar to what is conveyed in the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, which is currently particularly relevant in this country because the Joint Committee on Human Rights has just published an inquiry into how the government is delivering the UN Convention, whether it's doing enough to deliver independent living, because Article 19 of the UN Convention is specifically about independent living, and how the cuts are impacting on disabled people. And the report, as you might guess, is fairly negative about all of those things in terms of how the government is performing and calls for there to be a freestanding right to independent living introduced into our domestic legislation. That principle, that philosophy of independent living, had, as you probably know, been initially developed by people with so-called severe physical disabilities, but it was very, very quickly applied to people with learning disabilities, people who have mental health support needs, and also people who experience the frailty and cognitive impairment, which sometimes accompanies old age. And both these principles, the social model of disability and independent living, have had a very important influence on adult social care policies over the last 20 years. It's really important to remember that the most innovative policy developments in adult social care, i.e. direct payments and personal budgets, are actually underpinned by the idea that having choice and control over the assistance you need to go about your daily life, those two key policies were fought for as independent living policies and to deliver independent living. When the viewpoint came out, some of the people who were currently delivering personal budgets and trying to increase the numbers of people receiving direct payments were worried that what I was doing was backtracking on those policies as being a good idea on the personalisation programme, as it's called. And I'm not. What I'm raising is problems in the way that those policies have been implemented because there are actually two key factors which make it very difficult to ensure that the adoption of these principles, i.e. the social model of disability and independent living, does actually promote disabled people's human and civil rights in the context of adult social care as it's currently being delivered. And the first of these key factors is the long-standing failure of governments of all sorts to ensure that adult social care is properly funded. 
Um, and in the context of the current crisis in funding, we have to ask the question as to whether by campaigning for direct payments and personal budgets, we are actually bringing about a system where it is much easier to reduce the support available to individuals than if we had a system which was still about delivering services. It's much easier to cut somebody's direct payment or their personal budget than it is to close a day centre or a service that was delivering home care. I mean, traditional Labour councils in the um, 1990s opposed direct payments because they saw them as a threat. Um, they saw them as a threat to secure unionised employment for their workers, home carers, etc., um, that paid a living wage. Um, and they saw direct payments as part of privatisation of social care. And you could argue that they were right. And that's not to sound against direct payments. <laughs> it's just that it's a problem. Um, the other problem is that um, giving um, someone the resources in the form of a direct payment or control over a budget doesn't necessarily enable them to have choice and control over their support. It's, it's a means to an end, but it doesn't necessarily de deliver the end because unless those resources, the direct payment or the budget, is enough to fund their support, the support they need, and good quality, reliable services are available, um, then they won't have that choice of control. And the risk is that the resources won't be enough and the services won't be good enough. Um, and that, in fact, what you're doing is you're transferring the risk of the risk of not delivering good outcomes to the individual. It's no longer social services that have the risk of that of delivering poor outcomes, it's the individual that, that holds that risk. They've got the resources, they have to get on and deal, deal with it. The, um, the second factor which gets in the way of tackling disabling barriers and delivering independent living um, is a factor that, that dominates um, most of the social policy debates at the moment. Um, not just out of social care, um, and that is the dominance of an ideological approach which assumes that if you rely on benefits and services which are financed from taxation, then you are dependent, and that in contrast, to be independent is to be self-reliant and self-sufficient and not to be dependent on the state for any resources. Um, what's happening is in the current context is that, um, particularly in the context of all the stereotyping that's happening around people who rely on benefits, is that the concept of vulnerability has come to define those who deserve assistance from the state. Um, the, I, one of the reasons I mentioned the Joint Committee on Human Rights report is that I was actually, actually acting as, as a special advisor to the inquiry. And um, we, when we had the three ministers giving evidence, one of whom was Grant Shapps, he actually used the term deserving uh, to talk about people. I mean, he was talking about housing benefit. I mean, it's, it's the, the concept of the deserving and the non-deserving is very, very prominent at the moment. And the people who are deserving are people who are vulnerable. The word vulnerable is, is, is becoming a much more popular word. Um, and unfortunately, it's a word that many disabled people have started to take on to describe and to, to, to legitimize their need. Um, if you look at the blogs uh, that are around the debates on, on current policy, um, you have, if you have to be seen as vulnerable in order as to be seen as having a legitimate claim on state resources, then it's actually very hard to insist at the same time that you're a citizen and that you have equal rights to participate in society. And I can't put it better than uh, Neil Crowther, who wrote a blog that was published yesterday on the Disability Rights UK website, where he says, 
the idea that genuine disabled people are those who cannot be expected to look after themselves and are therefore incapable of independent living has a powerful grip on the public psyche and as a consequence undermines disabled people's claims to self-determination, equality and inclusion. The concept of vulnerability doesn't sit well with the concept of self-determination, participation, contribution, with being an equal citizen. Um, and yet, in order to um, legitimise our needs, to, you know, to say that it's okay, that it's legitimate for disabled people to receive support from the state financed through general taxation, we have to say we are vulnerable. And that's very, very problematic. Um, and there is a real danger, I think, that this uh, shift in um, ideology, in ideas about disability, will have a significant, significant impact in the context of adult social care. In other words, not just in the context of welfare benefits, but also in the context of, of of who is considered eligible for resources from adult social care and how resources are used. That's the crucial thing. Um, the examples of good outcomes that were highlighted during the piloting of individual budgets um, that before the current personalization program were things like um, somebody using their, their budget to um, buy a season ticket um, so that he could go to football matches with his mates. Um, that actually meant that resources from adult social care were being, were being used to promote his inclusion. Um, another example uh, was of where somebody used the resources they had. To, it was somebody who had a long-term um, long lung condition, which um, necessitated, had previously necessitated a lot of admissions to hospital. She created an air-conditioned room in her home, and that reduced the number of times she had to be admitted to hospital. I think it's unlikely in the coming years that we will feel okay about trumpeting those kinds of examples of using resources like that, yes? <laughs> um, because it will feel too much like privileging disabled people, you know. Well, she's getting an air conditioned room, well, I can't get one. <laughs> she's not, she's not a very vulnerable person. And he's not a very vulnerable person if he can go to a football match. Um, <laughs> it's, it's very, very prob problematic um, as to um, the, the kind of things that are happening at the moment which are undermining the co whole concept of independent living. So, uh, before I open it up for discussion, hopefully, avoid completely depressive you. Um, how can these threats be mitigated? Um, I think the first thing we need to do is to really, really understand the social model of disability and the concept of independent living and the implications for policy and practice. We particularly have got to, got to challenge the common use of the term independent to mean doing things for yourself not relying on benefits or services, um, because that's becoming so, so dominant. Instead, we should be promoting the idea of using resources funded through general taxation to create a level playing field for people who have additional support needs, enabling disabled people to access the three key aspects of citizenship that I mentioned before. Benefits and services should be seen as reasonable adjustments. We've got that concept of reasonable adjustment in the context of the Disability Discrimination Act. Um, and that's what support services should be seen as. That's what benefits should be seen as. They are reasonable adjustments um, to enable people to experience a level playing field. And therefore, they should be free from the stigmatization and social exclusion, exclusion that's associated with being in the seat of either benefits or of services. And at the moment, of course, we're a very long way from getting that kind of perspective accepted within the general public, particularly because of the contamination um, of the debate 
on disability benefits with the scapegoating of people on out-of-work benefits. But I think in order to make, in order to prevent that contamination really affecting what's happening in adult social care, we have to challenge it in the context of the debates that are going on on welfare benefits. We can't just leave that issue separately because it's going to contaminate everybody. If people have to be seen to be deserving and vulnerable in order to receive welfare benefits, they're going to have to be seen as deserving and vulnerable in order to be eligible for adult social care. And it's very difficult in that context to promote independent living. The second mitigating factor is the role of disabled people's organisations because it's disabled people and their organisations that, as I said, have been responsible for most of the innovation in adult social care over the last 30 years. It's disabled people who kept saying, address the whole of our lives, don't segment them up into different little services, across different services. And now that's, you know, everybody knows that's common sense, but it didn't used to be. It's disabled people who said that meeting low levels of needs help prevent high level of needs and help prevent things like hospital admissions, et cetera. It's disabled people who said, give us control over the resources and we'll produce better outcomes. That's what direct payments was all about and that's what the current personalisation programme is all about. And crucially, it's also disabled people who said and demonstrated that it's peer support, learning and getting support from people with similar experiences, that it's often the most valuable form of support and creates the most innovative solutions. Which leads to the third point, which is about co-production. The Disability Movement didn't use the term co-production. It was a term that was imported from the States. And in that context, and also in the context in which it's used by a lot of the so-called mainstream think tanks and by the government, it isn't particularly radical. But potentially it is. It's very fashionable at the moment, but it is much misunderstood and misapplied. Most importantly, it's not actually, it's really radical nature, potentially radical nature, is not really understood. And it's in danger of slipping into the dead end of consultation. That's what co-production often ends up as. What it should mean is that people who have a direct interest in the nature and the quality of support have actually got the power to decide how services are delivered. Purchasing power is not always sufficient to do this. And that's one thing that we must hang on to in the context of personal budgets and direct payments. And it's in those circumstances that we've got to address some fundamental issues about accountability of commissioners and accountability of service providers to service users, which will depend on developing much more meaningful levels of involvement than is usually currently the case. And what I also think it depends on, which I touch on in the viewpoint, which I think needs a lot more work on, is a revival and a renewal of the concept of a public service ethos. Maybe I'm just being old-fashioned and harking back to, you know, which wasn't a utopia in it by any means. But what I mean is that support services which determine whether people have autonomy and are able to participate and contribute to society. In other words, support services which really determine whether somebody can access their human and civil rights should be based on a clear set of moral principles. We've lost that. You know, it isn't all about purchasing power. Purchasing power does not give you necessarily choice and control. We need to think about what moral principles should be underpinning the services that deliver choice and control. This doesn't necessarily mean that services have to be delivered by central or local government in order to have a public service ethos. 
Um, but it does mean that we have to consider what, what structures and funding are compatible with such moral principles. And that last point raises quite a lot of questions about um, whether uh, a service which is, fun which is delivered by a profit-making organisation can have a public service ethos. Um, there, there, you know, I'm not coming down on one side or the, the other. I think that the crisis in um, residential care would tend to indicate no, <laughs> it's not compatible. But on, I mean, there are people who argue quite convincingly the other way. Um, but I do think that we have to think about what are the models, so what are the, uh, particularly the financial models, but as well as the accountability models. Um, that would really enable services to be delivered where it's, it's, it's not just the, um, you know, the rhetoric or the, 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 your first point of thing is we're going to deliver choice and control, but it's the last point because in the last analysis you could argue that an organisation that has to make a profit has to be accountable to its shareholders. How can it then be accountable to its service users? Um, those are the kind of issues that, you, that I think you have to address in the current context. Um, but all of these three points really are things that I was hoping might help prompt a discussion um, and contributions from you, so I'll stop there.